Welcome to a new episode of Leaders Talk. My guest today is Osrin Kopaitic. He is Head of Cloud Services at SAP. Installing some software and running it on a small scale is a simple thing to do. Delivering a mission-critical cloud service across multiple pro products on a global scale is a difficult thing to do. Your companies can do it. There's no books. Nobody teaches you that in any school. And that also kind of like forms a competitive advantage as you can figure it out. Leaders Talk, the interview podcast portraying leaders who are committed to better leadership, better organizations and a better world. Hosted by managing partner of Leadership Choices and co-founder of the Cosmic Foundation, Carsten Brath. Oswin is a software engineer and an architect who became a senior leader. And in the first part of the interview, he helps us to understand what is the challenge about cloud? Uh, what, are, what do we need to understand about cloud in order to judge uh, what companies are up to right now? And then we talk the nature, uh, about the nature of his role, of the team's role. He has uh, 1,700 people reporting into him. And his team is an antagonist team, meaning a team that Uh, draws a lot of uh, friendly fire upon them because they try to keep SAP in, in, inside certain guardrails when it comes to cloud strategy execution and what it all means and how it was to grow up in Croatia during war times. All of that we'll be discussing with Osrin Kopaitic and now right into the interview. Enjoy. A very warm welcome to Osrin Kopaitic. Welcome to Leaders Talk. Thank you, Carson. Thank you for having me. It's Osren. a pleasure to be here. Oh, yeah. It's a pleasure to have you here. Osren, um, tell us about what you do and who you are, please. Sure. So, you know, my name is Osren. I'm uh, I'm originally from Croatia. I've been living in Germany for about, oh, God, 11 years now, right? Um, I work with a, uh, you know, well-known German company, European company called SAP. It's the largest uh, largest and the most valuable uh, company in Germany, right? Um, I work in, my background is in engineering, software engineering. So uh, I'm leading a unit within uh, within SAP, which is called Global Cloud Services. We'll talk about what this unit does a bit more. And, you know, I live in I live in Munich. I've spent the last four years, I've been living in, uh, in, in, uh, in, in Heidelberg, much closer to the company headquarters, but then I finally got the uh, ability to move back to Munich, where we originally lived and where I really enjoy being. Um, I'm married. Uh, we have uh, one son. He's uh, 10 years old. He's currently finishing the Grundschule, the, the elementary school. So for all the parents and all the people from Germany, they know that, you know, in Germany, school Grundschule ends when you are in the fourth grade. And then you have to go to gymnasium. And we are in Bavaria. Uh, and I'm joking a bit sometimes that Bavaria is almost like, you know, it's a European version of Japan in terms of the pressure on school kids. So so that's how we're really focused on right now, like, you know, getting all the grades and closing everything. And uh, and and that's kind of like a focus, a big, big focus of a private life. We have adjusted our, our, our life for the past, you know, months to to get to, to the Bavarian elementary school. So that's high in my mind. It sounds like a family project. It's a it's a big family project. My my uh, my wife is taking the the brunt of it, right? Uh, and it was interesting to see how uh, you know, like everybody says that schools in Bavaria are something special. I always thought they are. I can't, nah, it's just a story. And then as he moved from uh, baden württemberg to Bayern, he was a uh, we moved between third and fourth grade. It was an interesting journey for this last year. Mm -hmm. And uh, tell us about your organization, Cloud Delivery Service. How many people work there, and what do they do? Okay, so so Global Cloud Services is is a unit within within you know kind of like SAP engineering in general, right? Uh, it's about 1,700 people. It's a global organization, so we are we are really based across the globe because a lot of the things we do are kind of like 24/7. So we need to be able to follow the sun fundamentally, um, and and kind of like what we do. How to explain in the simplest way, um, ACP is, is, is one of the world's largest cloud service providers. The company has been transforming over the last decade to in, into that role to from kind of like a software manufacturer into a, a large cloud service provider. And, uh, and, and if you are delivering cloud services uh, as products at a scale that SAP does, 
um, there is a lot of things in the back end, a lot of additional services and capabilities you need to build and run, uh, be it in the area of security, be it in the area of the core infrastructure, be it in the area of observability and operations, um, be it in the area of, of financial operations, the cloud FinOps is the common, which is an engineering category, right? And, and those functions need to spread across the entire company, right? So regardless of, you know, all products you build, they all need to kind of like be compliant, uh, be managed, be controlled, and be harmonized in a way, in a way how we run them and how we deliver them. And that's the role of this unit, right? These functions, these capabilities, these uh, engineering products are hosted in, in global cloud services. So let's assume our listeners and viewers are non-technical. So I have yes. some very, very basic questions, probably too basic for you, but simply help us explain your world or understand your sure. world. So there's two terms. I always come with dichotomies, right? On-premise versus cloud. What's the big difference? So, so let's define the, the, this expression cloud, because now finally I would say we are through the, 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 the hype, right, of it. So we we can talk about it in a more 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 objective way. Uh, fundamentally, the way you need to think about the cloud is two way. Number one is that it is a high level of software sophistication. So basically, you have you have built those, those hyperscalers or providers. They can build a software defined capability which allows them to abstract and run uh, those services and products, software services and products at a very large scale at the global level, right? So that's fundamentally what it has done. Like they have, they have kind of like managed to abstract that whole thing through a sophistication of the software, right? And then when you say the cloud, I look at it more as if you're if you're a consumer, right? Uh, it's a source of decision, right? So you could do, you could decide to your company. You have IT functions. You you require IT capabilities to run your business. You could decide to run everything in the basement of your building, right? And you will. Hire people who can do that. Maybe you're going to employ them in the company, or you're going to sign a contract with with a, a service company like I don't know Accenture and KPMG and Deloitte and one of those, and they're going to operate it for you, and you're going to run it in your basement, and you know where your hardware is, you know where your software is. They're going to run it for you, or your people are going to run it for you. That's fundamentally kind of on premise. You're you're in sourcing, or you could decide to do outsourcing of this capability. So you are going to sign a contract with somebody like Microsoft or Amazon, and you are going to deploy your 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 applications, your capabilities, and run them in that in their infrastructure on their platform, which we to refer to as a cloud. And then you again might be hiring your own people who are going to just still handle applications for you, or you might again outsource even that part and hire somebody else to do it for you. So it's better to think of it as a sourcing decision. Right. And you're deciding how you're going to source the capabilities in the realm of IT, so to say, that you need for your business. Right. That's the way I, I kind of like find it much easier to explain it in that way. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, there are formal definitions. Right. The the NIST in the US has kind of defined, you know, what the cloud is, which is like, you know, self-service capabilities and scalability and all these things. But fundamentally, if you are a if you're not a technical person, if you're running your own company or something like that, it's a source of decision. How okay. are you going to source something? And depending on how your business, you know, how your business is dependent on IT services, how critical they are, how complex all that is, uh, how much differentiating there is for you, you might go in different directions, right? Are you in a regulated industry where your data needs to be highly protected? Are you building something where um, you have some sort of like crown jewels which you truly do want to have in your basement? And you also have to think about it then, like maybe, you know, maybe you think your basement is safe as maybe it's not. Stuff like that. So, so again, it is a sourcing decision. Okay. And I've seen way too many cases where people make these decisions in a too much light mannered way, right? Uh, you wouldn't do a lightweight sourcing decision if you are deciding whether, you know, if you're a car manufacturer and you wouldn't make the decision easily in terms of like, you know, where are you going to source your parts and where you're going to assemble your cars. But but because in the world of IT, everything seems to be kind of virtual, right? Um, those sorts of decisions are sometimes made very easily, very lightly. And and I think that's a bit of a problem because how many companies, for how many companies are these IT capabilities or these cloud services truly critical for survival? Um, so we have a bit of a dichotomy there, I think. Okay. And uh, thank you. I understood that. That's, that's a good start. And... Um... Then the next one, once you make the sourcing decision, go to the cloud, 
there are terms like private cloud, public cloud, mm -hmm. converged cloud. What does that mean? Okay, so so let, let, let's let's go through it a bit because it's a bit of a combination of so private cloud. Think of it as like you, you have two forms of that. Uh, you could say that if you're having what we define as an on-premise, you're running things in your basement in your own data center, right? And then, but that thing you're running is quite sophisticated and allows you to have cloud-like experience when you consume it, meaning it's like scalable and automated stuff like that. That that's kind of what we refer to as private cloud. And it used to be a big thing in a like 2010, 2015, you know, we had VMware and Microsoft there was competing in the space. It's a less of a thing today, right? Um, and then you have public cloud. Those are big cloud providers, be the hyperscalers like Microsoft, Amazon, and, and, and let's say Google, or be it a, 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 a cloud service providers who are going higher up the stack and delivering, uh, you know, business applications and ERP services, such as SAP, such as Oracle, such as Salesforce, right? So you have multiple categories of those. Uh, Converged Cloud specifically is a SAP owned infrastructure as a service platform, which we run within the SAP, within our own company, in our own data centers. And we run it on behalf of the SAP, meaning that our cloud services, our business applications are running and are being delivered to our customers in the form of cloud services, be it software as a service or platform as a service. And we are running our own infrastructure platform. We don't do just that, of course. We're also partnering uh, with uh, with with uh, with the major happy scalers, right? Uh, which allows us, you know, this massive scalability, global reach. I mean, SAP is one of the world's largest cloud service providers. So, um, the problems and challenges we need to solve are on a completely different scale, right? And and the way we run this, the way we build this, is very different from even like what the largest enterprises would do, because again, it's a different game when it comes to scale. Okay. Now you are in the SAP is in the enterprise resource planning space. Uh, uh, yeah, enterprise resource planning space ERP, and many of your competitors these days started in the cloud. Whereas mm -hmm. SAP has much more history, uh, several decades of history, comes from the on-premise world. Yes. Can you explain in lay layman terms what was the big challenge? to get this transformation going inside the heads of the engineers and the salespeople and everybody else inside SAP to kind of compete, be able to compete with these new players like Salesforce or Workday mm -hmm. or what their names might be. I mean, look, that, that's a kind of transformation, by the way, which, you know, which, which other big players have been going through, like Microsoft is going to the same level of transformation because you're making, you have this very, very profitable business where you're building software and you are then delivering that software to your customers and then you're having partners as well as your own consulting going in and customizing that software for the specific need of what the customer needs so that they truly this business application layer or erp layer they're building is truly customized for that customer for the industry and it's delivering competitive advantage right and that that has been the reason why sap is what it is and about a decade ago sap started transforming and moving into the cloud space. Um, and I would say, you know, it's not so much kind of like that, that, you know, people cannot change, your thinking cannot change. The problem is you're still making 90% of your revenue here. And you're going and saying, well, this new thing is going to be the thing. And and that's not a SAP problem. I remember back when I was at Microsoft and, you know, like you had Stephen Ballmer, Ballmer coming, going at stage and saying, Every like we are all into Azure, right? And you're having thirty thousand people and twenty five thousand. Like, did you look at our PNL, dude? Like, we are making like Office, Windows, Windows Server, you know, like Dynamics, like that's billions. This thing is like you know, like hundred guys in in a shed in, in Redmond. What are you talking about, right? So that takes time, and and you know. If you're a company of that size, first of all, that product needs to grow. You got to invest into it. So you are investing into something which is not bringing revenue, and you have to have might, right? You have, have you know, kind of like you have to hold the line and keep the decisions. And then, you know, slowly you're changing the system how incentives work in a company. You know, so your, for instance, your your usually people first see it in the kind of like how do you uh, tackle your sales force, your sales folks, right? Because you know they are fundamentally. Uh, uh, measured by going into these like, you know, three-year enterprise agreement renewals and stuff from the, like that, right? So my behavioral pattern that may be more like a hunters 
but in the cloud world, you're more like farmers because the devil is in the consumption. And if if you have a cloud service that you're you sell it to the customer, your customer doesn't consume it every single day, and you don't show up every single day with the quality of the product, with the uptime, with the features, with everything, you're gonna fail. Um, one thing that people often forget, right? If you're if you're a software manufacturer, you build software, you give it to somebody else to implement it. And then, you know, if there are problems with the software, maybe you, you know, find some bugs and you release bugs and stuff, you release correction and stuff like that in a cloud. You own the whole thing. You are manufacturing the service every single day. And especially for, for a company like SAP, where our cloud services, our products are underpinning mission critical business process of our customers, right? It's not like, you know, email is kind of critical to the company, but it's not email and messaging. It's like, our system supply chain goes down, a, a, a major tire supplier cannot get trucks into the warehouse. A major food manufacturer has 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 production lines halting, right? Because the central inventory system isn't working. So first of all is that responsibility changes. You are now fully responsible for that service and for its impact on your customer. So it puts you in a different position right? So you have to build a muscle and a mindset and capabilities so you can actually deliver on the promise. And that is not easy because as people often say, you know, building a prototype is easy, figuring out the logical manufacturing is hard. It's the same thing here. You know, uh, you know, installing some software and running it on a small scale is a simple thing to do. Delivering a mission critical cloud service across multiple pro products on a global scale is a difficult thing to do. Your companies can do it. There's no books. Nobody teaches you that in any school. And and that also kind of like forms a competitive advantage as you can figure it out. And it sounds also that there is a cultural dimension to it. Um, and that cultural dimension is you have to be somehow customer obsessed and, and quality Absolutely. obsessed and not so much product obsessed, right? Yes. You need to be customer obsessed. And, and this is one thing which is usually the hardest with all of these companies, uh, even even the ones born in a cloud, by the way, because they still, you know, even, even they were born in a cloud, kind of like say, the, you know, they were all built by hiring engineers and people from kind of like normal software business. Uh, fundamental problem is the following, that when you're when you're designing software, you're often feature first. You're going to get features and functionalities which, you know, excite customers and get them attracted and all this stuff, right? You still need to have features and capabilities in the cloud, but you go talk to a customer, to a CIO of a major, of our major customer, and they're gonna go and tell you, listen, I will not get fired if there are three features and features missing or if like project gets delayed for three months. If I have a day of out, out downtime, even from an external provider that I have selected, like my head is gonna roll. And that's very different because then you have to start engineering for an uptime you have to, you know, the, the aspect of quality control and, and that your product is always on and that you have built the capabilities and the culture from the, let's say, operational layer, the infrastructure, all the way to developers, you know, building code and submitting it to the common repositories for, 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 for kind of like integration and delivery down the road. This culture of uptime needs to go all the way through. And, and, that's against something. I remember, like when I was studying, you know, I was I was I was studying engineering. I don't remember having a single, single course in five years of my studies that was talking about stuff like you know, mean time to restore and speed of reaction and and, and prioritizing features for stability and in large scale data replication and and disaster stuff. Be like nothing. Like and, and even later when I when I started working in industry, like it was not a thing. I was kind of like very lucky because I moved into the telecom industry. I started working from Ericsson. So those guys were about uptime. You went to like, you know, Vodafone and T-Mobile and those guys, it was all, you know, everything's triplicated, duplicated, you know, uptime, uh, do, doing upgrades without things going down, right? That was not the culture in the software industry, the opposite, right? Um, and, and for me personally, that was a big thing. Like it put my mind into that thing where, where you know, like that's something I find normal. But that was not a core thing of the software industry, classical software industry. And in the cloud, you cannot live and die by that. Okay. You are you're one outage away from, from ruined reputation. 
Okay, thank you. That's helpful. So now we have a basic understanding of the challenges and what the nature of cloud is. Now let's come to your organization. Um, so uh, we had a lot of prep talks to this. Um, yeah. And what I learned from your organization, I would characterize them somehow as the men in black um, <laughs> of SAP when it comes to cloud, uh, cloud architecture, cloud strategy, execution, that mm -hmm. kind of thing. And somehow what you're trying to do is, if I can describe it correctly, there has been a lot of momentum in SAP adopting cloud in different board mm -hmm. areas and different parts mm -hmm. of that large organization over 107,000 people, if I recall correctly. Yeah. And uh, a lot of things have gone in different ways. And and if I is it fair to say that somehow your organization's target is to herd cats and get this all together under one aligned plan? Not just us, there are a couple of other units doing that, but like a big part of our mission is, is to help SAP harmonize how they deliver their cloud services, right? And 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 it's actually intentional design because let, let's imagine I'm running a product team which is building a cloud service delivering to the market, right? My my focus is gonna be to try to grow as fast as possible. So I'm building for growth. I'm building for satisfaction of my customers, right? And I'm building for the uptime of my product. And if we are a company, you and I run a company which has only one product, that's that's the way you do it. SAP is massive. We are one of the largest cloud service providers in the world. We have many, 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 many products, right? Some of them are smaller and they're growing at rapid pace. Some of them are already truly critical for our customers, right? Um, and each one of these products is kind of like, you know, they, they're basically run by the product unit. And that product unit has an incentive. They need to be successful. So they have every incentive to run in a certain direction. And that's okay. That's the way it should be set up. But then you also need to have a kind of like an antagonist role, which goes and says, okay, let's look across all of these things. What does it make sense to harmonize? What keeps us together? What helps us deliver these services in a harmonized manner for our customers? and reduce this divergence. Why? Not because it's kind of like a cool thing to do, but also what we are clearly seeing from our customers is they're adopting more and more of our products. They're going and telling us, I also want to have a harmonized and equalized consumption experience. So if, if there is an outage, I want the look and feel and how you handle this thing and how you communicate with me to be very similar, regardless if I'm consuming this product or this product, right? If, if, you know, those kind of things they want from us. And it's a harmonization of customer experience, not only at the level of, you know, kind of like a user interface or, or, or stuff like that. It's also at the level of actual delivery of the cloud service and they're consuming it every single day, right? Um, and that's kind of like the way I see the role of mine, as well as unit I'm running, as well as a few other units who are set up like that, that is intentional. Uh, and and you need to have this kind of like level of tension. You know, if I was running a classical product unit, I would be I would run as fast as I can. And then you have this entire machine which kind of like holds things back a bit and says, well, you need to do that. You still need to run fast, but these are like the common things that keep us together. So we make sure that our customers do that this this, this harmonization, right? And and I think that that's really really important, right? That that's a, that's a key for success because. What differentiates SAP again from many of the other cloud service providers is that we are one of the largest ERP provider in the world, the largest business applications players in the world. But the stuff we build, the services we build are, are underpinning the enterprises of the world and we are helping them be competitive. And we, also, we are also a key part of them building a truly differentiating capability, right? And they are leveraging multiple other products to achieve that. So it's kind of like our duty to make it as harmonized and easy, easy consume for them as we can. And this, yeah. on the one hand side, there is the uh, the pr different products. Uh, many of them have come through acquisition to SAP, which, which adds to the history and why they are different. Mm -hmm. Every product unit is run by a president, um, and they are obsessed with their customer and running as fast as they can to make this big. And then on the other hand side, there's different units that play antagonists to um, execute the cloud strategy of SAP. And that means there's tension 
And that means yeah. there's potential conflicts of interest. And yes. I guess my question is, um, how do you do that? How do you how do you make sure to be in conflict and tension with all these people while still maintaining a good working relationship? Well, I, I would say this is that, that is the key source for success, right? And it, it's a combination of things. It's a combination of your ego and, and also can you put yourself in other people's shoes, right? Because I just told you, right? Those product units, they need to be obsessed with the customers and move as fast as possible and grow as fast as possible. And and I really do mean that. So I'm, you know, what I'm asking also from my team, and we are we are, you know, that that reason why we I think we are successful, we can put ourselves in, in their shoes. And that's one thing. The second thing is that that you truly do need to be consistent, that everybody understands that you have an interest of the entire company uh, at heart. You're not here to uh, balance your budget or solve your problem, your own problem as, as a leader or as, as, a, you know, as a unit, right? Something like, no, you're making, you, you want to help govern uh, for the benefit of the entire SAP, right? Um, and that helps diffuse a lot of things. Second thing is also, are you building relationships? And this is the key thing. We often have, you know, I had this conversation in my previous employers and sometimes even, you know, I have it with my colleagues here, is that, yeah, oh, like, you know, these, these people are so difficult and we have to push... Look, fundamentally, if you have made an effort that this takes time to build a, a close working, trustful working relationship with your main counterparts, and, and that doesn't happen overnight, and it happens to working together and interacting together and stuff like that, then when difficult decisions come in, you do have a relationship. And then if you also combine it with the ability to you know reason and compromise and be pragmatic, you're always going to find a way and find a reasonable path forward. Um, it is people often assume that they have a mandate or something like that. It happens in public, in politics and everything. We have a mandate and we're going to force everybody in this direction. Well, it doesn't really work like that, right? You need to have a vision, you need to have an intent, and then you need to have a relationship built with the key people, and that's going to allow you to bridge any conflict. And especially in a corporate environment, Trying to do some things without that relationship is very, very hard. And if you want to just do things through the pushing, A, you better be sure that you have a very, very, very strong mandate. B, you are only going to be able to do it so many times. So what I typically say when I when we talk with my, my team, I'm telling them, yes, you know, we we are in the position where we do need to govern and we do in some cases need to create a pressure from the rest of the company and we need to make the decisions which, you know, you're running one product and that decision is maybe detrimental for you, but it benefits everybody else. So it's really hard, but you always need to, you know, show empathy, explain why is this important for the company. And then in ideally 90% of cases, you're doing it in a way that people do in the end agree, or, or you're doing it with relationships. And then when you have that, then maybe in 10% of cases, you can actually push through the wall. But if you're pushing through the wall in 50% of cases, that's not going to last long. And it's not going to be beneficial for anybody. And obviously, it's a bit of a power play, right? And uh, oh, so it's... when you're reporting into a powerful board member, you have close ties to the CEO, you report to the mm -hmm. board on a regular basis, as do the others. Uh, is there is there a chance or is there a temptation inside of you to play that card? You know who my boss is? You know who I, I mean, talk to? Not, not in that way. But I, I really do believe, you know, power corrupts. And and that's something that my like you know there is an expectation that as you're going up in ranks, the, the higher your scope is, the higher your authority given to you, is that hopefully also you have been able to build out the, the mechanisms and shields you need to be able to wield that responsibly. That's the key, right? I think uh, you know. That, that's that's why kind of like that's why it takes takes time. I think you know, and, and, and life experience and everything else to to get to the position where you can actually actually do stuff like this. And I see that in all of my peers as well. Like all of them, it's quite interesting. Like you know, when, when you go down to the level of individual engineers, and I was I used to be like an individual engineer myself. Like you're very passionate about your thing, and you go, you think you know the best, and you're the smartest, and like you just go and clash. But what I also see is that really really strong senior leaders. They're able to have this broad strategic view, 
to understand where things are, what's good for the company, to potentially leave their ego at the door and make a right decision for the company. Those are truly the best ones. And, and I have observed plenty of those in the company. I enjoy that. I enjoy that. It doesn't mean we don't have hard conversations and you know we have different behavioral types. I'm more talkative, more aggressive. Somebody is more, more withdrawn and stuff like that. But fundamentally, this ability where they can have a broader view and have a conversation and make a decision about the company, you know, that's that's what differentiates great leadership from from let's say mediocre one in my view. Okay. Um and uh there, there's what I mean. Let's talk about your physique. I mean, you you work out <laughs> uh, for those yes. who, who who those who listen only and don't don't see you. Um, you have the physique of a wardrobe, right? I mean, there's a lot of uh, muscle power. Does, does, does <laughs> yeah, that play a much. role at all in in convincing others? Well, it, it doesn't. You know, like it's you know, in the context of physical intimidation. Like, yeah, like you know, COVID made it difficult because a lot of things are remote. But uh, no, 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 I'm just kidding. Like, the point is, you know, I, I, I enjoy, I enjoy physical exercise. You know, I, I trained and competed in judo. I trained and competed in water polo. I, I love sports in general. I keep myself in in a good shape as much as I can. Right? I do think I would like to lose about 10 kilos. I have a bit of a, you know, <laughs> extra fat. But it, it, for me, it's more at, at this stage of my life. It's more about ensuring that I'm in a good shape. I think that you can. You can do a lot only if your body's in a good shape, right? And and also for me, it's an aspect of kind of like helps me mentally. You know, it takes the edge off. Uh, uh, you know, you, any stress and frustration goes away, right? Uh, helps me balance myself a lot. I usually I usually do it early in the morning, and it really helps me. Helps me function quite a lot. Um, and and it's good to do something difficult every day. Really, really difficult. Sometimes when I really go hard on training, I go too far. I was going to say, well, okay, I, I went through the hardest thing already. I'm done. Everything else in this day is going to be easy, you know. <laughs> so, okay. so that really helps. And I mean, one of the things that I one has to admire when when working with SAP over a long period of time is that SAP is really trying to be big. I mean, is big and tr still is trying hard to be fast, 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 fast. And and one of the one of the things is when something is working. Um, SAP has the tendency to throw more at it. Like, okay, you do this, more responsibility, another team. And then it's like lift and shift of a couple of hundreds, maybe a couple of thousand people uh, that join your responsibility. You have been yeah. experiencing that in your unit as well. How do you cope? How do you, how do you do that? How do you absorb hundreds of people joining your organization, still having that mm. quality of leadership, of culture and all of that? Well, first of all, is that, so this is another key thing in my view again. Um, you can grow if your baseline is strong. So I personally have been very lucky that that my leadership team is really strong, really diverse, very capable, right? So that allows me a lot of breathing room, right? Allows me to, to be able to, you know, delegate trust, uh, delegate a lot of things they need to tackle. So when something new comes in, I'm able to focus on that new thing, you know, that maybe new leader coming in and there's new people coming in because I know that the rest of the organization functions really well. If your organization, your team is dysfunctional, if it's not working well, then things coming at you are going to cause chaos. And by the way, this is only in everything else, right? I mean, if, if you are grounded in a good spot you you have things under control a kerbal coming to you is just a kerbal you can tackle if your things are in chaos that kerbal may tip you over the edge and that's a fact in many other things as well so that's that's the way i you know kind of like for me right primary job of any manager regardless of where you are with level the, the most consequential thing you're doing is a selecting and hiring people that that going to work for you work for your org the people that you are managing or leading and then investing an effort into making those people successful and making those people autonomous and empowered to succeed and often people fail in one or the other first maybe they select based on you know criteria or speed like i've seen that before in my career like you know the most consequential decision is hiring and we don't spend enough time on it 
quite often, right? There are some some startups in, a, in in companies in the U.S. I believe who who experimented with a thing saying like that you cannot fire a person you have hired. That option is not on the table, and they say it has profoundly changed the way they select candidates because they start selecting not so much for the immediate competence but for the fit of the org and and, and ability of person to kind of like help this organization move forward and learn versus the current competence. That's one thing, and the second thing I think is really important. And we often forget that is, is when we are selecting and promoting people into the manager roles, especially, you know, like younger talent, individual contributors who have never been a manager, who maybe are subject matter experts. We forgot to tell them what being a manager is. Let's say you have 12 directs. Are you okay with having 12 one-on-ones every week taking notes? That's at least six hours a week, at least. And making an effort to learn about these people beyond their work, what drives them? If somebody's, you know, if somebody has a, a has a sick daughter, and that somebody has to commute extensively, if somebody has sick parents they have to handle, if somebody an immigrant in a new country is going through a stress, if somebody going through a divorce, do you have affinity to learn about that? No, please don't be a manager. You have to have affinity of that, right? I mean, we we want to talk about like my, again my background is engineering and and stuff like that. But for the for the last like you know decade or so, and you have you and I have been talking about it, like about the stuff that I read, you know. The first thing I say, somebody goes and tells me I would like to be a manager, I'm like, okay, Daniel Kahneman, think you fast and slow. Like a thousand pages plus. Did you enjoy reading the book? No. Uh, maybe, maybe stay coding. Because you need to have an interest into people and how their brain works and how, how their life goes. Because your primary job is to extract maximum value and performance out of these people. And, you know, they're not machines. You don't press a button and go away. Um, and, and I think that's the key aspect. Selection, development, and your investment into, into your talent. And if you're doing that well, you're going to be successful. And you're going to be able to handle workloads and more things coming to you. If not, then everything is going to be a fire drill. And everything's going to be stressed. It's going to be very, very hard. That makes a lot of sense. And Osren, um, another topic that I, whilst you're here, I need to ask you. We had Professor Dries Frams from WHU <laughs> here the other episode talking about AI. And he, for example, you know, put a severe depression on me by saying, I wouldn't invest in a coach anymore. ChatGPT can do that just fine. You know, you'll be out of a job mm. in no time. And uh, so what's your, you know, take from, you know, being at SAP, that, that global reach and, mm. and all of that? What's your take on AI? Is that a hype? Is that uh, something that will disrupt everything? Uh, every knowledge worker will go, go out of job? What's the perspective inside SAP mm -hmm. there? Well, it is definitely a hype. There's not even a debate, right? Um, in terms of, you know, like... Uh, Things are being overhyped, what it can do, what it cannot do. That's pretty much clear. Uh, somewhat unreasonable investments into, into startups, which are probably not that differentiating. That also gives that signal. But at the same time, I do have a feeling that this is a very significant disruption. In the context of that, you're starting to see impact in the world world we haven't seen before. We haven't seen that with stuff like you know 3D printing and stuff like that was supposed to change the world. No, no, nobody's going and printing their furniture at home, printing their own car. But but this could be something else. And the reason I think that and this is going to sound a bit nuts, but you and I talked about it, like I, I when I don't you know any free time that I have, I'm reading about this, going into this, like you know down to down to the deepest level of details. There is a couple of people. In, in my network, even SAP, where I get kind of like, you know, they run big orgs, but we are basically behaving like total geeks on this one. And and the reason I think is different is this, because fundamentally, these new capabilities coming from these large language models or multimodal models or generative models, whatever, you know, 25 names you want to do, these, these new models of how we are designing these neural networks and training them fundamentally. Uh, what is coming out of it is that this was not intentionally built this capability fundamentally manifested for something it was not working. And then when we started scaling it up, right, it started showing capabilities where, which were like, oh, like this is surprising, right? And, and now you're having some of the smartest 
minds in the world and massive amount of money thrown at both building the compute capabilities so they can scale further and then finding ways to train it, tweak it, and arrange it so that it becomes even better. And I do truly think that within probably several years, maybe I'm too conservative, I think like four to five years, that you could have a situation where where there is a uh, you know AI capability or large like or, or this model, right? which can actually outperform every single human and is actually able to start creating net new knowledge, right? That might not happen, but if that happens, then it becomes very, very interesting, right? Then it becomes like something extremely disruptive. In the meantime, yeah, you're gonna see disruption. You're already seeing it, like example with a, with, with Sora and some of the new new models coming up, which, which can tackle video where, where you're actually having investments into building new film studios being being disrupted and stuff like that. So there's going to be, I think, a lot of disruption, right? The question for me is, is this going to be, a, are we going to be able to use these new capabilities as tools that make us even better? Or are they going to be something which is going to be to some dystopian direction that some people think? I, I don't know. And here's a little note on our own behalf. With Osrin, I'm talking a lot about the importance of resilience, and he's a big advocate of all of that. Um, if you want to learn about your resilience, um, you can check out our products on our website, www.leadership-choices.com. Just scroll down and you see um, a lot of digital products that can help you to understand your own resilience. Uh, for example, we have the resilience map, which is an assessment uh, where you measure your own resilience with the executive fire index and the debriefing. There's the resilience guide, which is a, um, a training program where you can up your skills in terms of coaching and resilience coaching. Um, and we also have uh, the resilience journey, which is a digital product where you have a several weeks long, like 10 weeks long journey where you learn resilience skills for yourself. So check this out um, on our website, Simply get in touch with us. We we help you. We consult you to find the right product for you. And now back to the conversation with Osrin. Okay, Osrin. So um, if I'm a developer at SAP, yes, and I look forward three to four years, will AI do my job? I think uh, it's not an SAP, right? I mean, we we. I still think that the the value of of development teams is you know developers working in teams together is quite significant. Um, we are you know understanding customers' requirements, uh, tackling the level of complexity we are tackling. Uh, the, the the large language models we are seeing are unable to do that. Right? What they can do really well, and this is potentially disruptive, they can truly augment senior developers to be able to tackle even more things, to tackle higher complexity, right? To work at a high level of productivity. And, and potentially some people do say that they can, and this is something which worries me, is the following. If you're a junior developer, junior engineer coming out of, out of college or university, right? Um, there are large language models for some particular programming languages which are able to deliver the level of code which is surpassing what you're able to do as a junior developer. And you can still be trained to the point and get to the point where where that that actually becomes a tool for you which opens you. But will the companies have patience to invest and get you to that point where your productivity is going to be below of what a near zero cost tool is giving you? Uh, we are definitely going to do that, I think, right? Um, what I'm seeing at SAP, you know, across the company, we 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 have affinity to to hire fresh talent, to bring in your talent. We think it's very beneficial for our business. It's very benef beneficial for developing our products. It also gives, you know, we're making sure that our teams are kind of like diverse ac across across like full scope of the we feel like you know experience and age. We think it's very very beneficial. But if you know, do I worry about it in the context of just being a parent and having a ten year old kid who has you know, uh, affinity for for technology and coding and stuff like that. I mean, do I go in and and learn teaching how to how to code in Python? I mean, I think I still do because 
that's the way also for you to learn fundamentals of compute and how this all works and how algorithms function. I think it's very, very beneficial. But I do I do ask myself, right? I don't know. I don't know. And 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 what's what's kind of like concerning is that you're having even like very, very capable and smart people uh you know like uh, going and talking about you know massive level disruptions and all developers are going to be out of work i don't think that's true i think this is going to be the tooling but that there are going to be changes and that people are going to have to adapt and then it's going to be as disruptive as industrial revolution yes i think so i think so yes okay but, but I, 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 I don't look at it as a dystopian mm -hmm. thing Oh, but then again, I may be probably wrong in three, three years from now. Else? Yeah, let's let's talk again a couple of years and see what's happening. <laughs> yeah, exactly. If I'm still exactly. here, or if, if that interview is yeah, done by you're a, replaced by a, by AI coach, <laughs> right, by an avatar. Um, yeah. Asred, we would like to get to know you a bit more, the personal side yeah. of you. Um, so you mentioned that you are from Croatia, but when you were yeah. born, was it Croatia or was it still Yugoslavia? No, it was Yugoslavia. I was born in 1977. I'm, I'm old, and uh, we're getting old. This is my my world. And uh, I was born in Yugoslavia, right? So I finished uh, my elementary school in Yugoslavia, and then, and then we do counting. And then I started, uh, I started the high school. So in Croatia, you would study uh, elementary school is eight years. You start high school age of fourteen. Um, so I started high school basically in ninety one when the war started there. Yeah. And your parents were they? I mean, there were no computers back then, right? So where, was there anything that your parents did that made it very, very natural for you to pursue that path? Uh, well, you know, like you know, I, I was always a good student, and, and they were always like, you know, pushing me to be strong in mathematics and stuff like that. Uh, you know, they they had this view that you know, being an engineer, we like you know, typical like Southeast European thing, like you know, engineer or doctor or lawyer, those are three things you're allowed to, <laughs> allowed to be. And yeah, you know, I, I did get a Commodore sixty four when I was a kid and stuff like that. So so I did have exposure to that, right? And and also in that educational system. The, the STEM was kind of like highly respected. Um, you know, if you if you get great grades from math and physics, um, then they would let you slide on the other stuff, like music or or or, or you know like literature or something like that. <laughs> so so I really doubled down on being good at those things and then let me slide for everything else. You know, but uh, I clearly had affinity, right? So that was clear. Now, you were you're growing up in Yugoslavia in a time of a war or several wars yeah. actually. Uh, yeah. How, what, what kind of influence did that have on you? Well, influence in the context. I mean, like you know, when I think about it from today's perspective, it probably you know, it was just kind of like difficult. So I, I was very privileged, right? I was I was growing up in Zagreb, the capital of Croatia. That city was never on the front line during during the the war in Croatia, right? You know, we had we had bomb raids. You know, I, I would go into you know, we would go. You know, my I remember my dad driving me to. Uh, to training through the city with the light, the lights of the car off, because it was it was basically you know complete blackout because they didn't want to uh, give indication to the to the Yugoslavian Air Force that you know where they can drop the bombs and stuff like that. But but you know I did not experience any kind of like stress. Not nobody from my family was fighting on the front lines and stuff like that. We had some people in our broader family affected, but I got no trauma from the time. Uh, what what. What affected me more is that, is that you know at, at, during the wartime, economy was weak, right? We were we were not wealthy, right? It was it was fairly difficult, right? So, so we, I did develop the level of hunger for success, which you don't get if things are served for you, and I find it very very beneficial. I think it helped me personally a lot, and again as a parent, I'm thinking about it a lot because. I don't think that my kid is experiencing that level of challenge and he's a super bright kid, but that hunger, you know, he doesn't have that hang hunger. And I'm talking to him about some of the stuff and he's looking at me like, what? Like, what do you mean? I'm going to ask grandpa to see if this is true. And I'm like, okay, go talk to him. <laughs> He'll tell you, right? Um, so so I, I look at it more in that way that it really helped me form that, that hunger and desire to success. But I, I was not touched by trauma, but you know, we, we were having like, you know, you would sit in the evening and having a dinner and then you would have an air raid siren. And then, you know, all of us would go running down into the, into, into the, into the bomb shelter, right. And stuff like that. And then, you know, for us kids, it was pretty cool because we would play around and joke and play cards and mess around. It was actually kind of like a, a community experience, so to say. 
it would be a very different experience if I was on uh, close to the front lines, if, if my, my, my house was destroyed, my family was killed, or I had to run away to become a refugee, then we would have a completely different conversation. But I know people from my country who went through that, and that generated even higher level of hunger for them, and they are, they are extremely successful. So those things are good if you get through them without trauma, and they give you that edge. But as with every kind of a stress and pressure, it can go in other direction, right? Right. So I and, do consider myself myself lucky and privileged. Yeah. Very honestly, yeah. And it, part of your youth was also competitive sports. Uh, part of the martial arts. You mentioned judo, and I would personally consider water polo also as a martial yes. art. <laughs> Absolutely, yes. You learn about you know, ex yeah. I I got beaten much more in water polo than in judo. Okay. Very honestly, yeah. Like, so, like definitely. What do you? Uh, what do you? What did you? Or how did, did this have an imprint on you? How do you see? I mean, maybe it sounds like a big question, but I know it has a meaning for you. So, what? What kind Com of? Yeah, uh, yeah. Competitiveness. I mean, like, look. I mean, I, I was competing and trying to win, and you know, sometimes you win, sometimes you lose, and and, and and it does form you because it's hard, right? Especially like you know, waterfall in Croatia is like almost like the most one of the like, like the most strongest sports in the country right i mean they we, we just won the the world cup i believe like you know a couple of weeks back so it's a big thing right and and competitiveness is ruthless like you're trained there's a 10 year old kid i mean and you know it, it's not you know probably most parents today they would see how we would train they would call social services because it's a child molestation i remember you know we would go we would train on this uh pool called uh, it's an area of desire called shalata it's an open door pool right and we would switch from winter pool to summer pool in like april it's fairly cold still so you're going out there you're sitting on the edge of the pool we are freaking freezing it's not really fun and the coach goes and says we're going to jump and like half of us stands up and he goes and he takes takes his 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 you know uh, flip-flop and goes for a while and you get smacked on your bottom right and then you're looking at him coming toward you like i'm going to jump in a cold water i'm going to smack in the butt you know, making the calculation. And then jump Usually in the water. Jump. <laughs> yeah. Usually you jump, right? Or and stuff like that, right? So so it was hardcore because it was for competition. There is a reason why Croatians are so good at water polo. Not because we treat those kids really, really nicely. Okay. You know, it's, okay. it's a ruthless spirit of it. Uh, my, my point is, you know, it's really fun from this perspective. I still loved it. It was fantastic. And later on, trained judo as well. Like, you know, I think every, every, person every young person they have an opportunity should put themselves in position to compete in something difficult and it doesn't mean you have to be like on the top of the line stuff like that, but try to compete that feeling with the entering in the competition where you're you're going on a judo mat and you're going and you're you're going in front of your opponent and the, those that judge goes says like hajime like begin a fight fight like the level of fear like the, the cold in your finger and the sweat and then the sheer fear and nervousness you will not you know there are other places where you can get it, but this is probably the safest environment where you can get it. And and I, I think it's useful for a person to experience that. I think it's really, really useful. It helps you later, right? Oh, okay. Um, and then you mentioned joining Ericsson after your studies, and then you joined Microsoft. And mm -hmm. with Microsoft, you moved also into Germany. You started climbing yes. the ranks, moved into Germany. How was that? Well, first of all, even when I was in Ericsson, I was working kind of like global consulting. So I traveled a lot. I traveled a lot. I stayed in, you know, in many places for a long time. I, I, I worked for like three months in, in, in Libya during Gaddafi times. I traveled most of the Russian Federation of Community, community of Independent States at the time, right? I, you know, I, I, I spent like you know, nine months almost a year working in Prague and stuff like that. I spent like entire summer working in the, in in Deutsch, in, the, in Germany, in Bonn, uh, on the Deutsche Telekom account and stuff like that. So it was not really that stressful, right? Like moving to a different country. Uh, you know, German culture is kind of like similar to ours. We have historical ties. It was, it was no big deal uh, for me, right? Uh, the, the bigger bigger stress was or stress or new thing was like moving into a different role in Microsoft because the reason I moved to Germany was because my role at the time required me to be next to the major airport. So I was making a choice between kind of like, do we go to London or, or do we go to Paris or do we go to Dubai or do we go to Frankfurt, the biggest Europe's, biggest airports in Europe, right? 
Um, and, and, you know, the travel was quite extreme. I enjoyed it, but it's also, you know, it is really difficult at, at, at the scale that we were doing it at the time. Um, in Germany, the most difficult thing, honestly, and still is today after all these years, I mean, German citizen and stuff like that, and I speak the German, but German is like unbelievably difficult language. And but but the fence I have is Croatian is even worse. So you know, if you are a foreigner learning Croatian language, good luck. You know, for those again German speakers, right in Germany, you have this four filler, no one at the Marcus at the event. Which one is the last one? Indeed, right? Right. Great. We have seven. Croatian has seven. Like good luck. And then in German, they say everything is irregular. Huh? You don't know Croatian. We everything is irregular. So. But it is a different language, right? Uh, to master, right? Um, I, I do speak it, but I wouldn't dare do a do a do a do a podcast or or a public lecture. In that it's just that because I know that in the first two sentences I'm gonna miss three genders and stuff like that. It's just like it's, it's hard, right? Um, so that was the most difficult thing for me of the all because I really like want to you know I want to be able to speak it and stuff like that. It'd be super cool, and it's hard, and everybody around you only wants to speak English with you. So it's kind of difficult. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, the you were at Microsoft twice, and and that seems to yeah. be that it was a very formative time for you. Um, what mm -hmm. did you? What were some key learnings or role models or successes or setbacks that you had while being at Microsoft? Not many setbacks, I gotta say. Uh, it's more that you know I, I took the opportunities given to me. And and it really is the fact that you're gonna get opportunities in life, but you really sometimes, you know, people around around you gonna tell you, well, no, like this, you know, because basically when I moved into the global role, I I, I was managing a, a sizable team in the Southeast Europe, right? And I had a path to manage even bigger, and then I went to become a individual contributor architect again. And I remember like my manager at the time telling me, like, you you're insane, why are you doing this? You're destroying your career, right? Well, two years down the road, I was running a global team. Right? to join so or four years later so it was really you know you sometimes like you you got to make decisions which are going to look illogical to the people around you or people you're working with and they're going to help your career i think that's important another big thing in microsoft what i found interesting is is the following which is this i would call like you know pressure makes diamonds uh microsoft is the most valuable company in the world and it is there for a reason that the level of pressure on people in the org is very, very significant. It's very important, I would say, to European and German companies, right? Um, and then that is one of the reasons why they are so tremendously successful, among other things, right? But it, it's, it, it can be, I'll put it this way, like if you are not feeling comfortable being in a position where you do not know if you're going to have a job year after year, or if your entire team is going to get eliminated and you have to reconfirm the headcount in a position of everybody in the unit, right? And, and if you're not comfortable being like, you know, calibrated and stack ranked where the top performers are rewarded and low performers are, you know, kind of like, I would say removed or encouraged to leave and stuff like that, right? So like that worry, like, and then today's, I think today is a bit different. But it's still kind of like a derivative, and most of US companies are like that, derivative of kind of like Jack Welch mindset. Maybe it's kind of like tuned down, the snore up or out, and, and kind of like let's fire 5% every year, but it's not far from that, right? That does create business success, it seems to be, but at a certain level of cost. And if you are able to survive in the environment for for for, for an extended period as an individual, it's going to make you, it's going to certainly affect your ability that you, you can like your, your working discipline, your your attitude to work, you know, make you harder and stuff like that. Uh, but it may never be enjoyable. And I'm very open saying, and I say this to my, my colleagues, like I really enjoy being at SAP. And I think SAP is, you know, we are a large company and we are also focused on performing. We are comparing, competing with you. Most of our competitors are from the US. Let's be very clear with that. But we also have this aspect of you know, European and German business practice where employees are stakeholders and, and, and they do have a role and there is inherent respect of people. And I know that if you spend your entire career in a German company or maybe in SCP, you have a different view, right? Because you're seeing that oh, you know, we're really trying to pursue the stock price and growth and stuff like that. 
well, you have to understand a broader world. But, but you know, sometimes I would like for some of my colleagues, my, my friends to go and say, I get a stint in Microsoft for two years, then let's go have a chat, right? Um, even like some of the managers, I have a couple of managers I'm coaching, right, within ACP and outside as well. And, and I'm telling them to this story about, you know, how we would do between calibration in the old days in Microsoft, where, you know, we were flying the team of the, our leaders, like the management team, we fly in a remote location. And then you have like 300 employees and you have to stack rank every single person from one to 300. And then you take and you apply the bell curve, right? And top 20% you get massive bonus. The ones that really get okay, the top 5% are on the pip and they have to go, right? Every single year, all the time. And I remember I, I had there were there were managers who would quit on the spot after that exercise, right? Um, and that does foster high performance, but it's not the most enjoyable place to work, right? Or or at least for most people or some people is not. So I I I look and I you know I really. You know, I, I, I love my time at Microsoft. It was great there. I had you know, worked with a great team, great people, outstanding company, right? I also had a simple SAP. I love being an SAP. Also, different different times of your of your life, different things appeal to you. I really enjoy being an SAP. I think it's a fantastic company. And I like the way it's, it's you know, approaching things and really doing things. If we go 50, 10 years back and back in Microsoft, I probably had a similar opinion in Microsoft. Like, this is completely fine. People who are not good, they should go. People who are not top should get most rewarded, right? You also change your view as you grow older. Okay. You get a bit, hopefully you get a bit wiser, wiser as well, right? Talking I, about I, wisdom, um, you made a decision, a career decision that from looking at your, you know, biography looks like a short-term decision, let's say. And that yes. was you in 2017, you joined Accenture. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, and not for long, uh, half a year, I think. What what happened? Uh, well, basically, what happened is, you know, Microsoft is quite centralized org if you want to be close to engineering, right? Uh, we would often joke and refer to Redmond as a mothership, right? Everything is there. I, you know, the one well, reason I was in Frankfurt, there was a direct flight to, to Seattle, right? Um, every day, <laughs> so... Uh, so getting there was fairly easy, and I traveled there like almost every month. Um, so, so you get to the point where you hit kind of like a glass ceiling, where you know progressing further or or pursuing opportunities you want to pursue is only available if you are in 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 the Redmond on on the US West Coast. And for us, that was not really an option. First of all, you know our our, our you know our son got born in Germany. We, we we enjoy living here. Both me and my wife are you know single kids. So we have no siblings, right? So our parents, those three in Croatia, they're getting older than now in the late 70s. We were not really comfortable living on the other side of the world from them, right? Uh, we also like living in Europe, right? I personally like US a lot. My wife is not a big old fan. Uh, you know, we like living in Europe. We like, you know, the, that you can reach things with a car and stuff like that. We have friends here. So we decided not to move, right? So for me, it was clear, like, if I want to progress further, because, you know, let's be open, like, I do have ambition. I'm an ambitious, ambitious person. I want to grow and do more things. There was not that many options in Europe, right? I was looking at it. Then Accenture kind of, like, came up with a really amazing offer, right? Um, and the, the people who who interviewed me and who hired me are fantastic people. With Some of them are still friends today. I have a huge respect for them. I actually like the company. I, when I came to SAP, by the way, I hired a couple of amazing folks that I met at Accenture, so it's very, very clear. But, you know, when you're at Accenture, you, you, I, I went into the manager director role there, kind of like a partner level role. Uh, you know, I, I love engineering. I love building stuff. I love, you know, I, I love, I, you know, my core thing, like I'm really passionate about it. Like I build engineering and cloud delivery. That, that, that's my like, core area, which I enjoy the most. But for them, my biggest asset was that I was at Microsoft for so many years and, and that I was able, to, they could put me in front of the customers to sell. Right? And every managing director kind of like is expected to to sell. And I, I just don't enjoy that much. Right. I just don't. So so six months since I was like, you know, is, I don't enjoy going to work. Like, this is not fun for me. And it was, uh, you know, we had a couple of hard conversations. I felt really sorry for some of the folks there because I, I quit fairly abruptly. They was like, like, what's up? What do we do? Like it's, it's our fault. I'm like, no, it's just like you guys are doing what you're supposed to do. It's just that it doesn't fit for me. And I went back to Microsoft, basically to the same team, where I was actually did not refill my role, 
my role was still open. So my manager at the time at Microsoft, he didn't hire somebody to replace me. <laughs> so he just slot me back in. But but and it was like really enjoyable year, right? I, I went back for about a year. It was great. But again, the same thing. This the core problem didn't go away. I love the company, but I would need to be in Redmond to do the stuff I want to do. And ACP came in, right? I had a, I was discussing with them for about six months. Um, I, I met with you know Thomas Sauer Essig and so on. I always say like Thomas was the one who flipped me over. I was like on the fence, and he gave like a speech. I will not repeat. It was a good bloody speech. I told him, he he said he you know it was a good speech. He did really well, and I was like, yep, this sounds good because I I'm going to have opportunity to, opportunities to do things I want to do. And there is very, very few places in Europe where I can do it. Maybe even this is the only one because I know some people are going to say, well, you have other, you have, you know, telcos and you have posters and you have like, you know, Zalando, what they're like, no, 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 no. Like SAP is the only one. Like you, you don't have, we are not look. We, we are, when we are thinking about competitors, I don't think about a single, single one that is typically not on the West Coast of the US. So all of them are here, right? And and that was pretty much it. And I did not regret that decision for 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 a single day. Um, it was a really good decision. So it allowed me to stay in Europe, allowed me to do the stuff I love. And I also, the longer I'm in ACP, I, I really more and more see this place as home. I've been there for like over four years, right? And um, yeah, I am enjoying it. Cool, Osrin. Um, role models. Um, who were mm -hmm. role models, mentors? for you in your life and what did you learn i mean you know i don't know what i mean there was like people through my life which i met right in, in the beginning of my career you know some of the managers i worked with or even peers at microsoft and Ericsson, sorry they were very impressive um they helped me out a lot right advised me a lot uh then when i came to microsoft like uh, i will say my name the guy name is darren dylan right he's now in google he's not in microsoft anymore uh, he was the guy who brought me that global team, right? And he has been kind of like a mentor and a friend and a manager for, for years. I learned a lot from him. He's one of the most impressive leaders I've ever worked for. Really outstanding guy. Um, uh, and then, you know, also in SAP, like, um, you know, again, I, I don't, I'm, I'm still working there, so I don't want to talk about names. But I have encountered a couple of really, really impressive people. Some of them are my peers. A uh, few of them are, you know, are at the board level and I'm working with them or for them, right? Um, a few of them retired, right? And I had the chance, I had this privilege to interact with them like in the last year before the retirement where they were like really focused on helping me out with some of the things and giving me some advice and coaching me. And yeah, I've been lucky. Like, you know, I, I gotta say, I've never, I've never ever worked for a manager in my entire life, which I didn't like. I didn't have opportunity to, I, I was real lucky. I had some, some of the stories and I'm like, oh man, I was real lucky. Like every single person was the one who, who treated me well, was fair to me. And, and I was able to trust and work from them, right? Work for them. Uh, even if I, you know, kind of like had to leave in the end and kind of like abandon them, so to say, and go to something else, each and every one of them was was a, a positive force to me. And maybe it's also partially because, because of my own personality, right? I generally like people, right? Uh, but also, you know, don't underestimate the factor of luck. I always say this to people, like, you know, like, when you read about why Google, is, you know, there is this really cool book about, you know, brain and so on, like why Google is what it is. I mean, they were like lucky six times in a row. There was like seven things that they could have done, just like we would never know about the Google today. Mm -hmm. So yeah, yeah luck is a factor. Uh, I That's once I once uh, heard a quote saying, um, "Success is when luck meets the prepared mind." I would agree with that. Yes, I, I, I would. That 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 is really really good because you can be very lucky, but then you just don't jump on opportunity you have, right? Combining those two, but you could also, and, and also there is this one saying like you know, if you invest and prepare and you're ready the luck is going to manifest as well right so yep before we get too philosophical Austrian, what's next <laughs> on your what's next on your bucket list on the bucket list i mean I, this is going to surprise me i really don't have a bucket list right I, you know I, I personally have a vision of what i want to achieve with my team um i'm i, I feel very invested in that i feel very invested in in in, in sap as well professional perspective so like 
I don't really have a bucket list there. I would like us to succeed. We do have, as a company, we do have visions, we have plans, we have aspirations, and um, I, I would love to be part of that. And I enjoyed a lot. On, on, my, on in, 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 in my life, you know, outside of work, you know, my bucket list, I mean, I don't have a bucket list, you know, it's it's all about my family, right? Uh, we are very invested into, you know, Sven being successful. He's going into Bavarian gymnasium starting fall. So I think that's going to be a fun experience because it seems that Bavarian street gymnasium is like it's, it's a university. So that's going to be entertaining. My bucket list is for this summer. I, I, I do want to, we have, I have a couple of projects I'm working on with Sven. Um, uh, in, we, we are building some stuff in Python and we have some stuff planned to do with robots and so on. So I'm looking forward to like, you know, when, when he finishes the last exam, uh, I think May 1st is when he's done. He gets all the papers so he can enroll into gymnasium, right? And then we're going to have, you know, we can take him off out of the boot camp with his right now. And we can do some cool stuff. So that's my, I'm, that's kind of like the current bucket list I have right now. Okay. Okay. You know, <laughs> um, I mean, to, I think yesterday Donald Trump was nominated presidential candidate uh which is one of the news that is a little bit depressing uh what do you how do you stay positive when you watch news and television and see all the craziness going out going around i the don't world? really i don't I mean, this is this gonna sound wild Wait, do i follow news yes i do and, and this is partially i'm gonna say thank you to you you're not having working for a while right and this goes part from also our conversations and some of the things that i've been exploring is like I don't get upset about this stuff anymore. Honestly, anything. Like, it doesn't matter, like, political views, whatever. Look, I mean, things that you cannot influence are things you cannot influence, right? Uh, what matters is what you do and how you act on things which are around you. The way I'm looking at, you know, news and all this stuff is more like a good resilience training. Like, I, I do have a Twitter account, and I do sometimes read Twitter. You know why I read it? Because it's a fantastic way to train yourself not to get upset. It's really cool. It works and it works. It does work in your daily life. You know, being able to to kind of like, you know, stay fairly ambivalent or balanced despite of things around you is very, very beneficial, right? And I will tell you one thing, which is also quite interesting. I've been reading some of the uh, some of the podcasts and then some of the articles and stuff like that, where they were extracting some of the news articles from like, uh, like I don't know, like 1910 in the US or something like that. And you will read on them. It's like conversations like, you know, the civil war is going to start tomorrow. Stuff. People, look, people like having dramatic views and dramatic views sell. Um, and and I always try to look for, for the balance in things and so on. And what I'm really, really personally proud of, I think I've gotten to the point where I am passionate about things, but I really think that I'm, I'm, not, I'm now able to kind of like, you know, Work around things, they don't upset me. And sometimes if something really upsets you, just don't look at it. There is nothing, you know, will a US election affect potentially macroeconomy in Germany and, and, and you know our daily? It will. Can you do anything about it? Are you a candidate? Are you even a US citizen? No. Okay. What are the stuff you can do? Well, you can make sure that you're doing your work well, you're successful in your career, you take care of your family, you take care of yourself, you take care of your friends. Uh, and you take care of your community, right? Or, or you care about the community. That's what you could do. That's that's directly around. When you are driving a car and there is a, a, a somebody riding a bicycle ahead of you, and you're maybe a bit late, don't get upset. Don't be. Don't start screaming it and turn down the window and shout at them. Like that's what you can do, right? So do that. Um, affecting who's going to win the elections in the U.S. and uh, and I don't know. Uh, I don't know whether asteroids going to hit the Earth and so on. You cannot affect that unless you are a scientist working on specific projects for detection of asteroids and interception. You probably can't do anything about it. So don't worry about the things you cannot influence, right? That's a bit of stoicism. I mean, I've been talking about it. Um, yeah, I really, really, really like stoicism more and more. I'm not good at it. I still lose it sometimes. I guess it's my personality. But I'm I'm keeping, I'm, I'm continuing to learn. It's, it was borderline to be very wise, what you said. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> it was borderline. <laughs> so last yeah. question officially, uh, Osren. What's the one thing that I haven't asked you that, that could be interesting for our viewers and listeners? So, so one thing you didn't ask me is, you know, what am I, what am I most about personally in the future? Okay. 
You haven't asked me that, right? And and I'm not gonna have nothing like you know like oh, like nuclear war and aliens coming in and so on. You know what scares me the most is losing physical and mental capacity as I get older. I'm I'm forty seven. I'm gonna be forty seven in a couple of weeks, right? I still do sports. I read a lot. I'm trying to be super. I, I think I'm physically stronger than I ever was. But you know what? Also, the things do hurt in a way that I haven't experienced them before. And that makes me very nervous because I don't like that. I don't like that. So what I'm finding myself is reading a lot about stuff like longevity and how do you stay in shape and so on and so forth. And and that scares me. I know it's kind of some of you, but, oh, why didn't he say, like, I'm worried about the future of my kid? No, I think my kid is going to be fine. My family is going to be fine. Like, and, and honestly, as long as I'm fit and I'm here, like, I'm here, I'm here to help him, right? The worst thing is, like, if you're not here, you're not capable of. And and that scares me because that's something I really don't know. Like, how do you, like, you do when you are, like, in your mid-50s or mid-60s to stay in shape. And I don't know how will the inevitable decline, how would that affect kind of, like, my feeling of safe self-worth, right? That's something we all have to figure out as you get older. But if you ask me, like, something which kind of, like, get nervous about and I think about more than I should. That's the one. That's the one. That's maybe the reason why I train so hard and so on. It's kind of like, kind of like trying to be rational and saying, well, if I put myself through these hard things, if I really can like train hard and challenge my body, maybe the decline doesn't happen. Maybe I'm going to be the first person who's going to be 95 and still be able to bench 120. Um, and you know, I guess it's okay to have some wild dreams as well, right? But yeah. That's one thing which kind of scares yeah. me. Yeah. Well, thank you for sharing that. I think this is a this is something that people who are very competitive know or experience, right? Uh, I mean, I can very yeah. much echo what you say. Um, that this, you know, experiencing the tendency for physical decay or that everything gets harder. Everything you can still do it, but it just gets harder and more painful, and recovery yes. takes longer. That's just something that is hard to. You know, get your head around. It is. And, and the danger is you do something irrational. Like I got a little a couple of come up a year ago. I came to my wife and said, like, you know what? I, I would like to I would like to compete in judo again. And there is the world veteran championship in like I'm gonna be 52. And she looks at me and she's like, What is wrong with you? I'm like, you have done a training last week and you couldn't walk for two days. Like, what are you talking? You're gonna go and train with 20 year old kids. Really? That's what you got? It's called midlife so crisis, Oswald. You know that, right? It's called a, yeah, yeah. It's just like, you know, I'm I'm not buying a Ferrari. I'm thinking about going back to competing. And, you know, that that's kind of like, that's my that's my version of midlife crisis. <laughs> it's funny. Okay. Oswald, that was fun. Thank you so much for, yes. first of all, explaining your world to us. And we I learned a ton. And I think our listeners too. Thank you for that personal tour through your life. Um, I know that we will stay in touch, so all the best and uh, look forward uh, to talking to you soon. Yes, thank you for having me and talk to you soon. Thanks. So that was Osrej Kopaitic. What are your thoughts, reflections, feelings? Anything is welcome. Uh, send us a note to leaderstalk at leadership-choices.com. Leave us a review. Obviously, we appreciate a positive review. Uh, all of that. And uh, yeah, we'll reply to everything that you send our way. And now stay healthy, all the best. And uh, yeah, see you soon in two weeks time with another, another episode of Leaders Talk. Mm -hmm.